I said, so when we go to explain something to a business leader and they don't get it, it's not because we're not smart enough, because they know they are. They will look at us as being too incompetent to explain it. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative, in conjunction with Cyber Reason, is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC. I'm your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Steve Katz, Executive Advisor, Security and Privacy, Deloitte, and the first CISO. It's one of those things where I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, there was, there were data security officers or data, data security managers. Uh, uh, but at the time, there wasn't, there were no information security executives by any stretch of the imagination. And City Corp was hacked in 1994. It was kept well, well hidden. Mm -hmm. I spent about, but it did come to the attention of the board because uh, approximately $10 million uh, had been moving across the network. Their in, uh, international funds transfer system, pre-internet, pre mm -hmm. which is running in a deck backs environment, was hacked. Uh, $10 million went across the wires. Mm -hmm. uh, 400,000. Which is quite a bit of, of money at the time. I mean, when we look at some of the breaches and the costs today, but we have to go back to back to those days. That was that was pretty significant. Yeah, but and let's just about everyone. Everyone speaks about the ten million. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a member of the clerical staff, actually in Latin America, who noticed some transactions going across uh, the network. Looked at them and said his clients don't do those kinds of transactions. So it was actually caught when $400,000 had just gone through. So the actual loss was just $400,000. Uh, as 10 million moved across, but it would be monitored, and as uh, mules, if you will, the guys who were gonna pick up the money showed up at various bank branches across the world. They were picked up and arrested as they tried to pick up the money. And there was no trouble finding out who did it. It was too rushing uh, kids out of St. Petersburg mm -hmm. who were trying to find a way to get free telephone service. And they found themselves in a deck vax environment, didn't realize where they were, but they were interested enough to say, hey, what's going on here? It was a development data center and all the, the development data center was not well protected at all, part one. Part two, all the the only data that was used was production data in the development environment, including production uh, security information. In addition, uh, there was a requirement that the uh, customers uh, use, use the encryptors that were provided to them, and they didn't want to do that. So the message was coming across clear text. It made it a very easy attack for anyone to undertake. The guys were smart enough to figure out where they were, and they started moving money a little bit at a time. It was caught when $400,000 went through and it became obviously a, a, a board action. And the, um, as a result of the board presentation, City was the CEO of City was told that they had to find and, uh, and appoint a, uh, a security executive, which had never, they'd never been mm -hmm. there before. Uh, what, what made them uh, want to appoint a security executive. When boards of directors get involved, they think grand thoughts, for which I'm forever grateful. Uh, so the, it was a six month review pro interviewing process. And the, I wound up reporting, you know, two down from the, uh, from the chairman, which is a tremendous honor. And when the job was offered, they told, they gave me two interesting challenges. One is to build the best cyber information security department in the world. Here you have a blank check, go do it. Mm -hmm. So so many of the things you take for granted today, like 
business information security officers and security awareness and tra education and training programs and uh, security leadership councils with business executives. Uh, the brand new idea. Mm -hmm. The other was they were going to announce the hack uh, a month after I got there. So I thank them for ruining my career. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, so that's from being put under the gun, isn't it? And I said, and the other challenge is, hey, you've got blank check, build something great. Whatever the heck it is, because the board said and the uh, CEO says, they have no idea, just go do something. Mm -hmm. But the other challenge is to limit the damage. And I'm sitting outside my backyard at five o'clock in the morning because I used to get in pretty early and my wife's inside getting, getting ready because we'd go to the city and, uh, together and she said, congratulations, city just made the news, they announced the, uh, the hack into the funds transfer system. So I got a bunch of phone calls after that. And the challenge they also gave me is, we want you to go out and meet and spend time with our top 20 international banking customers and limit the damage. Did you have relationships with them prior None to that? None whatsoever. These were around the globe. And so I sat back and said, what is it I can really do that would limit damage? And in my own head, if I can, if you can tell a, a meaningful story that they will understand and be as transparent as possible, you've got a shot. So I put together four, five, or six questions of, of what, before I touch the how. And the first one was, do you want to know who's coming into your, are you, are you coming into your system? Do you have any concern about that? Uh, once you know who they are, do you care about limiting what they're going to be allowed to do? So if you're, you are looking at folks in your, you know, your organization who are going to be transferring funds, do you want to put a limit? That's what they can do. Mm -hmm. uh, next one is, are you concerned about the integrity of information? If you want a decimal in the wrong place, you're going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. Is confidentiality at all a you know, concern to you? Uh, if something goes wrong, do you want to know about it? And how soon after it goes wrong do you want to know about it? And if we're looking at a transaction, would you want a signed receipt for the transaction? And then it took each of the questions and I said, here is how City is answering these questions today. Here's how we're doing answering these five questions in today's world. And here and here's how we, we will be answering in six months, and here's why one is better than the other. And why you'll have the improvement and why it will prevent the kind of situation that took place from ever taking place again. Not that something different wouldn't wouldn't happen. Hmm. And when I left the meeting I said, I'd really like you to do two things. I said, first of all, here's my home phone number, my office phone number, and that time was a and here's my page room number. Have any questions, call me. But second, I said, you want to have, check and see how you were answering these questions within your own company, because you are financial institutions, you are whatever business you were in, you really should see how you're doing these things within your company. But also, Citi isn't the only bank you're dealing with. So go out to all the other banks and see how they're answering the questions. Mm -hmm. So did you get any resistance from from the other banks, saying, they, why, within, why do we have to do this? Oh, absolutely. Within the, within the, the next month, all 20 people that I met yeah. with called me and said, the other banks will not talk to me about this. They will not tell me anything about it because it's security. And I said, that's ridiculous. I said, you're a customer. You have to know what, what they're doing. I said, transparency is incredibly important. You've got to take the mystery out of what, what is going on. Mm -hmm. uh, the initial expectation is that if we could limit our loss to 50%, you know, attaboy, you've done a great job. We did not lose a customer. Only because of, being, you know, telling a story that they understood. Because these, these are financial guys. These are controllers, they were VPs of finance, these are treasurers. So we were able to explain what happened and how it happened. And going through the methodology, the tools that we had in place, that look, this is what we had here now. This is the weakness. Here's how we're making it better in six months. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, knowing who you are and how. Uh, being able to limit what people could do. Here's how it's doing it now. Here's how we're changing it. When it came down to confidentiality, these are encryptors that you have to put in place in your company, and we will have encryptors in place at City. Uh, they must be turned on and used. Mm -hmm. If you prefer not to, uh, I have to tell you, I'm going to go back to the bank or at City and recommend that we no longer deal with you.
Because this is, again, we don't want to go through the same kind of situation. And they were very open to that. If you tell us, let's say, it's not to you, if you're telling me, me the treasurer, if that's the right thing to do, and you can tell me why it's the right thing to do, I'm with you. So at 20 different banks, uh, you're, you're probably going to get some that aren't, aren't going to make their dates that, you know, or the plan that, were, that was set up. So how, how did you deal with, with, with those banks? We were easy. Uh, I had the re full resources of the city from both the uh, technology and operations perspective, as well as the individual bankers. Because I went to city's bankers who were dealing with these customers and saying, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Here's our commitment. So it wasn't just the IT departments that, that you were working with then? Uh, IT right? departments were the smallest part of the issue. It's, mm -hmm. From day one, the underlying philosophy is information security is a business risk issue. It's a business risk management issue. You want, and when I went to each of the, each of the bankers at, at City, I said, these are your customers. This is the risk we're, po you know, we're posing that the customers are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And here's how we're going to minimize that risk. And they've got to understand, and you can work with them, as to why we're giving them the best service pos uh, that's uh, possible. And uh, reassure them that the dates that I gave them are the dates we're going to, uh, going to meet. Uh, but, and what made it fairly easy to do that is, A, I went to the, head of, uh, the heads of IT, uh, the heads of uh, infrastructure, the heads of network, and the bankers, and having the force or the support of the board and the uh, and the CEO sort of made implementation not easy because it never is, mm -hmm. but the commitment was there to do it, and they knew the it was highly visible, and they knew that uh, it was a six month time frame, and I had a ninety day report to the board and a hundred eighty day report to the board, and no one no one wanted to be in a position of having me say. We would have made it, but these folks didn't get to it. <laughs> right. uh, so it, visibility to our customers was great, but visibility to the board was outstanding. Mm -hmm. And we then sat back and said, okay, now how do we build a global organization? So we came up with this concept called BISOs or BISOs, which are you know, common today. Term mm -hmm. didn't exist then. And what we did with that is we went, we went to every major business head, and this is what an executive vice president was really big deal, a big deal in banking, said, we want you to appoint somebody on senior member of your, your team who is respected within your line of business. We will train them in the amount in security and the things they need to do. They'll be the bridge between your business and my security department. We put together a uh, three to five day training program for all of them. Uh, when they completed it, they got this you know, really nice certificate, which didn't mean a heck of a lot other than uh, the head of operations, the technology guys, the chief technology officer, and the head of the line of business presented this certificate to him, or her as the case may be. And they, there were monthly phone calls where we had all the BISOs on the call uh, we had follow-up training with all of them. We had an annual off-site conference. And we also, while they were, they were being paid by the line of business, we had a pretty significant, significant input into their, their bonus compensation. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, available at Amazon.com and other booksellers. So what what were the what were you expecting the BISOs to do? Translate our our concerns back to the business and what was important, but more importantly, translate what the business is needed from us. Uh, and the whole premise was this is a business risk issue. We also put together okay, a so that was your communication back. It was the bridge business. by directional. Yeah. But what they did is they had they were the they had the expertise in the business. So they have to clearly articulate any potential business impact, which is far more important. Mm -hmm. And then we would, we, the, the rule always was, let's find a meaningful path to yes. And there, there will always be a meaningful path to yes. It's going to require compromise on both sides, but we also said, the, we, I hear people still talk about stakeholder management, and it really became stakeholder partnership. Yeah. We're in this thing together. Mm -hmm. 
We also put a risk acceptance process in place, which I thought was just fantastic. And it was in, on paper at the time. But it was, okay, here is the policy or standard that the business head said they felt they couldn't comply with. Here was the reason why. Here was the risk as they understood it. And it was prepared by the BISO. There was one line on the bottom that said, moving forward with this is against this is the key word, against the recommendation of the CISO. Mm -hmm. Because the business owned it. We, didn't have, we don't own risk, the business did. Mm -hmm. And it would be prepared by the, B, by the BISO, by the BISO. If something came through that really looked like it was egregious, I would call up both the BISO and the business head and say, look, you have the right to move forward with this. My recommendation is that you do not. Let's, you know, and it's really, I really think you should rethink this. Mm -hmm. Two of the metrics that we reported regular, uh, on regularly were number of risk acceptances by line of business. So it became highly competitive because those went to the board. Mm -hmm. And number of risk acceptances that they, that they decided to move forward with against my recommendation. In the 10 years I was doing mm -hmm. the job, not yeah. one, not one. Because no one there wanted to say they knew more about the cyber risk th than I did. So they thought, let, let's rethink this and come up again with a meaningful path to yes. So how often did you present the, to the board it those was, kind of metrics? Well, what City had, and it originated way before I got there, was something they called a Windows on Risk Committee, which is, was a result of, uh, I think, real estate crisis that had taken place years before. And they met every four months. And the John Reed, who was the CEO, sat in the middle. The top seven executive vice presidents, it was almost like the round table, nice of the round table, sat in the middle, and then the next level sat was the next tier around them. And the president, they met every you know every four months. We were on the agenda every four months, and that's where things were presented. How long did you get on the agenda? Uh, generally, fifteen or twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. Didn't need it, did not need any more than that. Mm -hmm. It was the agenda was. Here's what we said we were going to do when we met with you at the last meeting. Here's what we did or didn't do. Here's why we didn't do it. Or here's why we did. And here are new issues we have to talk about going forward. And here's the risk to the, to the bank as we see it. Mm -hmm. And then the question always was, what are you doing about it? And here's our plan going forward. Sure. And the, what we did into the going early on, if we looked at things in terms, I find simple little analogies work. So we looked at three buckets. So we always talk to them in terms of three buckets. Bucket one was old stuff that had to be co uh, corrected, cleaning the kitty litter. Bucket two are things that are now on a plate that we have to deal with. And bucket three are things we expect coming down the pipe going forward. And our discussions that would be, this is a bucket one issue or this is a bucket two issue. Mm -hmm. And they were comfortable with the concept of buckets because it's very mm -hmm. easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Another, two other concepts we used. One was on any project. I had my project uh, manager report, report to me, or my leader, leadership team reporting to me, uh, on any project. Uh, if when they did their, their monthly, a weekly, monthly report, they would talk, talk to me in terms of, of speed bumps and roadblocks. A speed bump was an issue that held things up, but they could take care of it. And a roadblock was something significant enough that they needed me to go take care of it. Okay. So, and there were very few ro roadblocks. But when, the, when there were roadblocks, they were very clear about it. But they were much more comfortable saying, this is a speed bump, I can take care of it, this is how long it's going to take. Yeah. And, and the, the response back to me, are you sure it's just a roadblock, or just a speed bump, or do you need me to jump in? Nope, I've got it. The other is, this is incredibly important, I think, I said, our job when we speak to business leadership is to recognize that business leaders, correctly or incorrectly, believe that they are very bright. And mm -hmm. it may or may not be true, but they really believe they're very mm -hmm. bright. And so, so when we go to explain something to a business leader and they don't get it, it's not because they weren't smart enough, because they know they are they will look at us as being too incompetent to explain it. And I said to all of my, my uh, team leads, I will take one, one phone call about somebody being incompetent. I will not take a second one. 
because I'm sure you don't want to be part of a, a department that has incompetent people in it. I don't want to lead a department that has people who are incompetent. Mm -hmm. So when you were going to present to any of the business leaders, talk to your husband, take the presentation, go and talk to your husband, your wife, your kids, your mother, your grandmother, and go over what you're going to say with them. If they get it, you know the business leader will get it. You can't be condescending, mm -hmm. but a meaningful message should be translated into terms that people are going to understand. And Einstein, one of his, a quote attributed to him is, if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Your job is to make it simple. That's uh, that, that's very insightful. So for the the CISO today, I mean, y you have seen so many different changes in this industry over the years with you know platforms and social media and cloud and 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 all these new things. And we have a a whole new generation of of CISOs coming up to where this is actually a career path now. So what what advice would you would you give to the to, to the newer or experienced CISOs. Yeah, it's fun. I, I, I mentor a, a lot, significant number of CISOs and mm -hmm. I coach C, uh, security teams. And when I meet with a person who's recently appointed CISO or been in the role for a while, uh, I ask a bunch of very, f some fundamentally simple questions where you'd expect to have a readily a, a ready, ready answer. And the first one is, hey, I'm, you must be really glad you're in this job, right? Yes, I am. I'm really pleased. Okay. Why does your company have a security program? <laughs> and you would expect you'd have a ready answer. No, you don't. But my gosh, you should. I said, well, okay, next time we get the other, you know, make sure I have an answer for that one. Now I got another question for you. How, how does your company make money? Yeah, you'd expect to have an answer for that too, right? No, yeah. not all the time. And then the third is, who are the business leaders? In today's world with Google and with LinkedIn, it's really easy to find that. Who are these people? What are they like? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, yeah. But these are fundamentally simple questions. So it's getting to that, that soft side. I mean, uh, you know, people have grown up in technology and, or risk and compliance or audit. Mm -hmm. And now, now they're thrust into this role working as a business partner. Yeah, what, what is, I, one of the things I do, and it's uh, still with guys who are saying, I, who are now really incredibly brilliant technology guys. And they turn, you know, we'll meet with them and say, they want to be a CISO. So the first question I ask is why? I, Damn good question. As I, and the, I say, right now you have, as a, you are a technological expert. You have the best you know, safety net in the world. You decide to walk out of here on Friday, you will have a job paying you 20% more on Monday. Great safety net. Now you're saying you want to step into an arena that requires communication skills, negotiating skills, evangelizing skills, marketing skills, sales skills, all soft. All soft, all soft mm -hmm. skills. And as, so first of all, you, you have to say, gee, do I really want to do that? And you have to really want to start working with people, not working with technology. But also understand, as you move from the, 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 you know, the security or the technological expert role, you, become, you move from expert to proficient to knowledgeable. And you may never climb that hill again. Do you want to give up your safety net? Because staying as a technologist is <clears throat> it's not a bad thing. It's actually a pretty damn good thing. <clears throat> but if you if you want to move into the <clears throat> to the security executive role, make sure that's really something you want to do, and it's going to take time to go in there and get yourself a a coach, a mentor. Thank you, somebody who will be able to walk you through this path. You learn tech, you didn't suddenly wake up 10 years ago, find a little magic lamp, rub it, and suddenly you became a brilliant technologist. You work towards that, you develop skills, you hone skills. You had teachers, you had mentors, you had coaches. How do you plan to develop the soft skills that you're really going to need to be the security executive? Uh, one of the things that's gone through my head, I'm not sure if it's ever really gonna happen, I think there really needs, almost needs to be a bifurcation of role. Your chief security executive and your chief security technology executive. 
both should get about the same pay. Both should be equally rewarded. Both should be equally, you know, as highly equally regarded as uh, as specialists. But figure out which one you want to do. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with being the chief security technology officer. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. And the other one I would look at more is the chief security risk officer, the chief information risk officer. You're the one who's going to explain what needs to be done, why it needs to be done. Work with the chief security technology officer to figure out the how, make sure the what and the why is being addressed, and then get back to after you, when they do the how, verify that the hows meet the what's and the mm -hmm. why's you were talking about. Great, great, great perspectives, and I, I think that that you know covers both of the very important disciplines uh, that, that we have today. I'll throw in one more thing. So, saying if I was starting today, I'm, uh, if I was starting today, and this was sort of an epiphany when I couldn't sleep one night the past couple weeks. Said, if I could do something really, if I was starting in this role today, if I were back at the role, of, you know, moved in something new, I would say the going forward, a key to moving effectively forward within information risk, information security, is will be data science. It is will be AI ML. Whether you're looking at threat gathering, threat hunting, threat intelligence, uh, uh, email, Bill, get the data, work with the data scientists so that your threat intelligence is really refined and honed for your organization. That your SOC gets, you know, based upon the threat intelligence that you're dealing with, gets the kind of information you need. That your threat intelligence goes back and looks at your entire vulnerability management program. And I think the data science is really the key to the future of what we're going to be doing in information risk. And I think that's such an exciting, exciting, exciting mm -hmm. position to be in. Mm -hmm. So my big banner for now is how do we best manage data science and, and information risk? And let's do that and we'll do something truly remarkable. Well, th this has been great, Steve. I, and I, I, I agree with you. I think understanding all these different technologies, um, understanding the, the soft skills, applying those in our organizations, uh, it's really what's expected of the, of the CISO today. And uh, it, it's been an honor to have this conversation with you. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for your insights. I'm sure this will uh, benefit uh, people in the Cybersecurity Collaborative uh, that much more. So thank my you My pleasure, Todd. My, completely my pleasure. Thank you very much. CyberEason is the champion for today's defenders, providing an endpoint security platform to prevent, detect, and respond to malicious operations on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. CyberEason, end cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more at cybereason.com slash CISO stories.